the gender internet and sorry, gender and internet governance roundtable. Um, a roundtable is a format where we try to get as many quick inputs as possible on a particular issue, and we thought that it's quite critical to have like a session that really looks at the multiple dimensions of gender in relation to. Um, also, again, the different areas related to internet governance. What we've done is we've divided this session into four different areas, which is around access and development, women's public participation on the internet, and um, internet governance and principles, as well as finally safety and freedoms, the issue of safety and freedoms. So each of them, um, there's like different speakers who will be speaking at each of these different areas, and we've asked the discussants to answer some of these questions. One is, what are some of the key gender-related issues on internet governance in the areas that you'll be speaking on? Um, and what can different stakeholders do to further integrate and mainstream gender, um, gender concerns into existing work on internet governance, as well as showing some initiatives and best practices among stakeholders? So we would like to maybe start the day with a, with a clap, because that's always good for energy, right? <laughs> So as you can see, we have a lot of people, so it'll be quite strict in terms of timing. We're, look, we're asking for inputs from three to five minutes. It's quite speedy lightning inputs. We will stop at each of the different sections to give an opportunity for questions um, to clarify if there's anything that you don't, um, that you would like further information on, or if you would like to also make an input on that particular section, uh, session, then you will have a space to. Um, this session is organized by APC, as well as Internet Gov uh, Democracy Project, as well as the Human Rights Commission of Indonesia, whom we have at the table. Anya will be helping me to moderate the session and run around and be like a very strict timekeeper because I'm terrible and I'll be like, oh, really? That's so interesting. So yeah, so Anya's the one that you have to like watch for. Okay, so without further ado, maybe we can start with like a very quick, when be just before you speak, you can just um, give an introduction to yourself, who you are, which organization you're representing, and then your time starts. <laughs> okay, so let's start with um, on, the, on the issue area of access and development, and we would like to start with um, Cheryl. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to the organizers of this panel for inviting me to speak on this important topic. Uh, it's an honor to be up here with so many experts on this topic, and it's a real pleasure to be with all of you in the audience here in Bali. My name is Cheryl Miller, and I'm the Director of International Public Policy and Regulatory Affairs for Verizon Communications. And so today, I really wanted to discuss a few of the initiatives that Verizon and some other businesses have been doing to help improve the areas of access and development. And access, I really see as being the first step, and it's two-prong. Um, first, it's really uh, the physical connection in your environment. And second, it's um, removing any barriers that would prevent you from being able to use the Internet. At Verizon, um, we've been working on the physical side um, to really push out access to all of our technology as the United States has some very remote areas um, where they're hard to reach and hard to service. And so we've been partnering through various programs with smaller providers to make sure that anyone w within the United States who wants access to our advanced technology services can achieve that. On the uh, barriers front, one particular barrier that we've been focusing on has been education. And we've really been trying to partner with different organizations to encourage women and young girls to pursue careers in the ITC ICT sector and to engage in science and technology careers. One recent um, program that we uh, did in conjunction with the US State Department that we are proud of was called Tech Girls. And uh, a, gr a group of um, young women from the Middle East and uh, North Africa came to the United States uh, from various countries. They were ages 15 to 17. And they partook in a two-week program. The first week, they took uh, some very interesting courses on coding in New York. And the second week, they participated in a job shadowing program. <coughs> um, companies such as Verizon, Microsoft, and others participated. And it really gave them an insight as to what we do on the policy side related to internet governance, some of the key issues that our company is struggling with, and so on. And this is not just something that um, we are, are pursuing in theory. It's something that our company has fully embraced. 
uh, six out of our eight most senior VPs who are engaged in internet policy are actually women in our company. And it's something um, that we're very proud of to have um, these female leaders that are, are doing uh, important work in this field. The second area I want to touch on really quickly is development. And at Verizon, we have a, no, a new program uh, called Powerful Answers. And we really believe that our technology um, has the power to be used to solve some of uh, the world's most pressing issues, whether it be healthcare, education, energy conservation. And these are um, some issues that can, and some models, excuse me, that we're for formulating that can really um, be looked at in the developing world. And we're actually working on some uh, programs right now, I'll touch on two, in healthcare. One is um, actually called the Children's Health Fund. And what it is, it's actually a big blue bus, um, if you see it. And uh, it is leveraging cloud technologies um, aimed at assisting children who are um, Im impoverished or perhaps don't have proper medical in insurance or living in homeless shelters throughout the United States. And this bus shows up at these shelters or their schools or other areas where these children need access to health care. And they enter the bus and they're able to have a dialogue with a doctor who is in a, a remote location someone, somewhere else in the U.S. and actually receive a diagnosis. And so it's really been improving um, health care for these kids. We've seen some great success. We are also working on this in another um, way, actually, in a partnership with the Swinton Charitable Trust and the University of Virginia in India and the Philippines. And again, it's leveraging cloud technology in the healthcare sector um, to address some of these issues. Uh, so I just want to close just by saying, you know, it, it's, it's so important that women have a voice and have a role in this space. And the technology, it keeps evolving. Um, and we, we try to keep innovating. And so it's great to see so many people here that are interested today. Um, and I look forward to the other panelists' discussion and, and the dialogue. So thank you so much. Thanks, you. And oh, this is much louder. <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> I have a very loud voice. I don't need such a loud mic. Um, oh, I'm tweeting. Oh, okay. So thank you. It's really great to hear when uh, private sector is also investing quite a lot in terms of ensuring access for the disadvantaged uh, and those who have much difficulty in gaining access in terms of infrastructure and other issues. So the next person we would like to invite is Nenna. Or Nenna. Voila. <laughs> I must say gentlemen and ladies because, I mean, I can't say the gentlemen. Hi, guys. <laughs> oh, okay, that's four. Cool. Oh, six, seven. Fine, that's good. Um, good morning. My name is Minna. Um, I work with the World Wide Web Foundation, and part of what we do is the Web Index. We try to measure, as I said yesterday, the health and the, the performance of web in about 80 countries and um, what we ask in all in, in this is what we do is to set up a list of measures ask critical questions that will help us find answers uh, and one of the questions some of the questions there, there are a lot of questions I can tell you but I, I, w I want to share some of the critical questions that have to do with gender and one of them is to ask countries and gender experts in analyzing web access to find out to what extent the government has prioritized support for increased access for, for, to the web for women and girls. It's not just general access, but how do women and girls, how are they supported to, to gain access? How has this, how is the web, how has the government prioritized support for increased training in how to use the web for women and girls? One thing is to be able to use the web, but one other thing is to be able to train to know how to use the web better. To what extent do girls have equal access to training in how to use the web? relative to boys because it is very easy to say oh there's a training center anyone can go and get trained but actually do we put in place the measures to to motivate girls and women to go to such places 
to get that needed training. Is there an official program that supports the training of female government employees in web use? You find out that you go to many administrations, there is a secretary that is most often a woman, but then the other women, we don't see them. So they train just one woman, but then the other women are in the background, and you may not be sure they can use that. I have actually been to places, I will spare the name of such countries, because they have official delegations here, and I asked the women, you have a computer? Yes. But you don't turn it on? says, no. It is only for photo purposes. So that when the minister comes, he stands by one side of the computer, I stand by the other side, and we take the picture, we send it to donors. After that, we cover the computer again. I don't use it. I don't really know how to use it. So we need to factor these in. To what extent are there women in positions of leadership in the ICT field? And now I can quote this government because I'm going home and I can face the minister anytime. In Cote d'Ivoire, where I live, and the minister has said that there is no single woman in the directorship position in the Ministry of ICT and Posts. That's, my, that's the country where I live in. We don't have any woman leader in the top director's position in that country. You must find out what it is in your own country. To what extent is the web used to expand access to information about reproductive and sexual health rights and services in the main local languages? Um, I just came from a two-week trip going across the Sudan and the Sahel part of West Africa, going from Cameroon to Nigeria to Burkina Faso, speaking to local women, local women farmers. And these are people who need reproductive health information. The question is, how is the Internet used to give those messages to the people who need it, especially in local languages. Have you thought of it? So when we are talking about women, gender, it's not just the women who see here, but it's the women down to ground zero, if I can use that word in this sense. I don't know how many more minutes I have, but we have more questions about um, the use of Internet in um, sexual violence, domestic abuse, how, do, how does the internet come in as a tool for safeguarding the well-being of the woman every day? So when we're talking about internet governance and gender and internet governance, it's not just those who have access to the internet, it's actually how we use the internet to take care of the global rights and the well-being of the person of that gender that is not male. That's my own gender. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. And that's actually a great segue to the next thematic area which we'll be talking about, which is around public participation. Women's rights to public participation on the internet and what does this mean in terms of how does it impact on their right to, say, for example, economic, social, political well-being. But before we go into that section, I would just like to open the floor for five minutes for any intervention, discussions, questions, or if there's something in particular you would like to comment on the issue area of access and development. I see one over there. Shaka. Thanks. I'm Bishaka from Point of View India. I was actually taking notes, so I thought this is a good opportunity. So one is on the point of... Um, you know, the first one about access, I just want to say two things. One is that uh, what used to be the gender gap in the pre-digital world in what were called STEM fields, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, has now rolled over into an overall gender gap in the digital age, right? And one interesting thing is that, you know, from the point of view of openness, many of us uphold open source projects precisely because they are open. But if you look at the gender gap stats, on OpenStreetMap, 3% of OpenStreetMap contributors are women, which is very, very low. 
And if you look at the gender gap stats on Wikipedia, it's again between 10 to 15 percent of contributors are women. So we have to examine the concept of openness through the lens of gender. Mm -hmm. You know, is open source, open cultures, are they really opening it up for everybody? Or are they just opening it up for a particular set of people? Yeah, and I don't think they're in sort of against each other, but I think there's something to be thought about there. The second point also that I wanted to make is about the um, access point and sort of trying to, you know, bridge the digital divide and get women in. You know, sometimes it's not just gender, it's sometimes gender plus other barriers. So for instance, I train a bunch of rural women journalists in India who are Hindi speaking to use the internet. And they come from a region of the country which has very poor electricity, etc. So, you know, there are obvious barriers. But the biggest barrier they face when they go onto the internet is actually language. When they try and do a Google search in Hindi, they find like one-tenth of the material that we find in English. So some of our interventions have to think about gender, you know, in relation, in conjunction with other things. Yeah. Thank you, Vishaka. So the question of intersectionality is very critical when we think about any issues that relates to gender. Um, is there any other interventions from the floor or questions or clarification? No? Okay. So we're good to move on to the next, next section, which is around um, women's rights to public participation. I would like to start with Anita, um, if you can. Yeah, okay. Um, I thought since uh, I'm speaking again at the this watch this afternoon and that is also about political and public participation, I will probably speak about that concept then. But here I think since it's a very critical and important round table which pertains to sorry Anita, can you introduce yourself first? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Anita, Anita Gurumurthy, and I'm from an NGO called IT for Change, which is based uh, in India, Bangalore, India. And we're involved in uh, field-based programs, global advocacy, and in research. We also uh, work on areas other than uh, gender. Of course, if you work on gender, then you work on all areas. But we also consciously focus on national governance, e-governance, as well as national public policies and education in ICTs. <coughs> So I thought that we would, I would really uh, uh, do something that I think is important when we talk about the IGF uh, and gender and gender justice, which is an analysis of the way in which we as feminists do our politics and how it may be important to pause for more than a moment and to take stock of what may require soul searching. Um, Part of this comes from a comment that I read in the analysis of the 2012 report cards, gender report cards, where I saw this phrase repeatedly in many sessions that gender was not discussed or the notion of women and women's rights didn't come up because, quote, open, it was not seen as relevant and therefore not raised, quote, closed. So, Partly, I think we live in a world where it's hard for people to make the connection between, for instance, broadband access and women. You know, what does broadband access have to do with gender? Partly, I think also it may be uh, a struggle um, and to be harsh, a failure on the part of people who should be doing this kind of public education and democratization of knowledge as to why does broadband matter in the debates on gender? Why does inter internet governance, governance matter in the debates on gender? Rosie Bridetti, a philosopher, political scientist from Europe, said this very beautifully. We live in times of fat-free ice creams, alcohol-free beer, and feminism without women. So perhaps we need to ask ourselves if the space of the internet governance um, you know, the dominant internet governance discourse is indeed a place where there is feminism, 
but there is really no problematization of women and women's rights. So the question before us is, if the personal is indeed political, how do we make the political personal? And Bishaka gave me a beautiful word this morning over breakfast, which is, where is the anger? You know, and I think uh, in most other spaces we confront this raw emotion of anger, activist anger. And uh, I think we somehow seem to have traded it off for other benefits. And I'll quickly wrap up, but um, it might seem like I'm, you know, <laughs> positing this very enigmatic question. I do have my analysis. Um, but I, I don't think there is enough time for us to go into it uh, now, maybe in the discussions. The thing is, how do we, I think we are not only talking today about what is it that we are critiquing and what is our agenda, but how is it that we are moving towards a politics of representation? What are we talking about and who is talking about uh, the people that we think we are representing and therefore who we are, what our frame is, and what is being visibilized and what is being silenced, I think uh, this is important. And uh, we will come perhaps later during the discussion time on uh, issues of uh, the uncritical embracing by feminists of notions of multi-stakeholderism. So what have we traded when we have done this? And uh, to end with uh, a, a quote from Nancy Fraser's um, the coming of neoliberalism, feminism and the coming of neoliberalism, which is her latest collection of essays. What she says is, what are at issue here are the procedures for staging and resolving conflicts over injustice. How are claims for redistribution and recognition to be adjudicated? And who belongs to the circle of those who are entitled to raise them? So she says, other than the political voice among fellow citizens, it is important to also look at what she calls meta-political injustices, which arise when the division of political space into bounded polities miscasts what are actually transnational injustices as national matters. In that case, affected non-citizens, and in our case, people who may not even be connected to the internet, are wrongly excluded from consideration. So I'll stop here. Thanks, Anita. Great set of questions around representation, around where is the rage, and around also like trying to claim access for justice. So the next speaker I would like to call upon is Siti Nurulaila, who is the head of the Indonesian Human Rights Commission, and uh, Camilla Manuf, who is with Institute Pelangi Pompan, will be translating. Terima kasih. Maaf saya menggunakan bahasa Indonesia. Oh, I can Good morning, excuse me. Uh, I would like to speak in Bahasa Indonesia. Sebagai perempuan, saya sering tidak percaya sampai sekarang. Kenapa saya berada? Apakah betul saya berada dan duduk di sini untuk memberikan apa uh, untuk menyampaikan sharing apakah saya sebagai perempuan betul saya sebagai chief di national human rights okay uh, as a woman sometimes i still feel unconfident how i can sit here to talk about uh, gender and internet and even right now as my position as the head of national commission of human rights karena sejak 93 uh, Komnas HAM tidak pernah dipimpin oleh perempuan dan selalu pimpinan berasal dari tokoh nasional. And since 1993, um, the position of uh, as the head of National Commission of Human Rights is always a uh, male domination, and it's uh, usually it's like uh, the uh, local famous activists, uh, which is uh, who's men. Yeah. Dan sekarang baru pertama Komnas HAM dipimpin perempuan dari daerah dan di antara uh, pimpinan Komnas HAM saya termuda. Um, and um, uh, right now I'm here sitting as a, the first um, head of National Commission Human Rights as a woman, and uh, I came from a, from a small province. 
uh, as the youngest uh, coordinator from all of the previous coordinator. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Uh, di Indonesia, penggunaan internet, uh, perempuan seringkali menjadi objek di dalam uh, apa, pembahasan di internet bahkan mendorong terjadinya konflik horizontal uh, di mana kasus Sumbawa, uh, kasus Bali Nuraga menempatkan perempuan sebagai uh, pemicu untuk terjadinya konflik horizontal. In this case, I would like to uh, tell you um, one of the case uh, in a conflict area in Indonesia in Sumbawa how um, people use um, the image of a woman or share the naked picture of a woman as uh, the tool for to provoke a conflict among two villages, for example. Yep. Foto perempuan yang meninggal uh, disebarluaskan melalui internet uh, dan disampaikan kebencian terhadap uh, satu etnis tertentu karena dianggap bahwa perempuan yang uh, difoto telanjang itu adalah korban perkosaan. Um, uh, in this uh, uh, issue, um, the picture of a, the dead body of the woman uh, shared to the other village to provoke the conflict, and then uh, in on that image there is a comment that how the other uh, the, the guy from the other village uh, raped this woman until and then did a violence until she died. Dan terjadi uh, konflik horizontal di mana uh, disebarluaskan kebencian terhadap uh, etnis Bali. And actually uh, this photo is being used to politicize the uh, racism on uh, different ethnicities uh, to Balinese people. Dan berakibat pada ratusan rumah uh, rusak. And the effect is uh, hundreds of houses uh, was broken or burned. Dibakar juga ya. Yeah. Dan uh, pada kasus yang lain terjadi kriminalisasi terhadap uh, perempuan yang sedang memperjuangkan uh, hak atas pelayanan kesehatan. In this case, you also there's um, a case about. This is about a criminalization of. Um, how women should get access for help. Ada juga persoalan di mana situs LGBT di block oleh uh, pemerintah atau provider. There is also a case in Indonesia how LGBT sites are being blocked uh, by the government of Indonesia at this moment. Dalam hal ini Komnas HAM melihat bahwa pemerintah uh, tidak konsisten menjalankan uh, hukum yang ada. In this case we can see that how Indonesian government is not um, implement the consistency uh, on, the, uh, on the, the regulation in Indonesia. Pertemuan ASEM dan Indonesia bagian dari pertemuan ASEM untuk melakukan uh, situs untuk melakukan pemblokiran terhadap situs itu harus diumumkan uh, kepada publik tapi ternyata uh, itu tidak dilakukan. One of the result of the Asia and European meeting is uh, they mentioned that uh, if any government uh, block a, so a local website they have to publicize the list uh, which is blocked. Yeah, but, sorry, but it's not done by Indonesian government. Dan Komnas HAM dalam posisi memberi dukungan kepada uh, masyarakat sipil, uh, kelompok LGBT dan aktivis perempuan untuk melakukan gugatan hukum terhadap pemerintah maupun provider atas pemblokiran tersebut. In this case, our uh, National Commission on Human Rights uh, is supporting uh, LGBT and women to gugatan hukum to uh, to to do uh, to prosecute uh, on the, on the court, on the law process, so that uh, we can go forward for justice. Okay. Nah, di Komnas HAM sendiri, uh, isu internet masih belum menjadi pembahasan yang dianggap penting. 
uh, at this moment, uh, the issue of uh, internet rights or governance uh, uh, is not in our agenda yet. Termasuk di dalamnya melakukan pembahasan terhadap internet dan gender. Especially if we are talking about uh, internet and gender issue. Nah, karena itu uh, saya akan melakukan karena itu saya datang ke sini dan setelah ini saya akan melakukan upaya untuk uh, isu gender dan internet diangkat oleh Komnas HAM. Uh, for, in this case, after IGF, um, I would like to bring um, the issue of internet and, and internet and gender issue uh, as one of the agenda in uh, on internal National Commission on Human Rights in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and the next speaker is Valentina. Okay, it's difficult to continue after such a uh, definition and expression of how women's body are the ter territories for fights. Anyway, Valentina, I come from Bosnia-Herzegovina. I define myself always as a feminist and uh, an internet activist. I will uh, use as a, a way to talk about public participation a case uh, that we, we had in Bosnia Herzegovina. We ran a small campaign, it was called the Nien Isbori, means her elections. We had the local and municipal campaign and we were focusing on women and on the social networks because we think, we know how it works. You know, when party has to present their list, they will have a 30% of women. This is the only way that their list can be accepted. But they would not spend a, a funding, a euros, a dollars for campaigning for the women. They are just a number. They are like socks. They change every, every election. So we thought let's help women having a space. The only space that women can manage by themselves are the social media. So the Facebook, the Twitter. We were mapping uh, and tried to support their participation. Uh, the whole campaign went well from a knowledge point of view because we understood that all the women that were using Facebook, uh, Twitter is not so much, they were of course immediately attacked uh, because the Facebook uh, was also a, a private space where they were talking about their lives, maybe some parties. So it was used as a source to provoke the attack. And plus we had to compete with Miss Election, Miss Isbury, because this is what is happening. Whenever there are women in a public space competition, online, offline, there is always a Miss is trying to hijack in the old situation. Uh, I think that the reason why it's important is that uh, we have right to public space and the public space online, if it's a big social network or it's a blog, it's the actual space we can inhabit it and that we can populate with different representation. Because this is important. We need to populate the space with different representation, with the representation of ourselves, how we are, our values. Uh, but it's a space that we have to continually fight for, to consolidate, because it's a space uh, that uh, we produce the same kind of attack and diminishing and policy of uh, making laughing at that we find in the public space. So the, we are there, women are there, young women are there, less young women have challenges because they don't know how to use the tools. Uh, but it was proved that it was, it's the only space where the discussion can happen, when the people can contact one to one. So I think uh, uh, we are already there, we just need to continue to make this space available. And that means that we need to fight in these places to make understanding that yes, still gender is a women issue, but women issues has to become issues of everybody because uh, women are the only minority that are the majority of the world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think you should clap. Come on, I think we're a bit sleeping up. <laughs> Thank you for the great interventions. It sounds like from the first two in the beginning, even as we're trying to figure out how to increase women's um, access to the internet and to benefit from all of the potential um, opportunities that the internet and its development provides, there are all of these other issues that's coming in from representation to ways to limit women's public participation online and all of these different strategies from violence to minimizing of your value to just superficial myths and so on and so forth. Um, I would like to now open the floor for another five minutes for any interventions or questions.
Okay, um, uh, my name is Francisco Proenza. I've done uh, quite a bit of uh, work on uh, ICT for development. I worked for United Nations for many years. Uh, later on, I was uh, in, the, in the academia, and uh, right now I'm a private consultant. Uh, I want to pick up on something that Anita said, which was that uh, gender is not talked about because it's, it was not relevant in a particular meeting that she attended. Um, I'd like to uh, bring a quote from a um, person called Jackson Katz. He says, when we act as if white people don't have some sort of racial identity, as if heterosexual people don't have a sexual orientation, as if men don't have a gender, then the dominant group is rarely challenged to even think about its dominance. Um, I'll give you an example, and it's an example that goes to uh, what was brought, about, brought to the fore by the, our West African colleague, which is the issue of women's access to broadband. Uh, cyber cafes. Cyber cafes are, you know, throughout the world, they are probably uh, the, the place where most people start uh, learning how to use the internet. Um, and yet, you know, I have done many studies on cyber cafes, and time and again, people find, and I've seen studies many times, they mention in passing that there are more women than women. What is amazing is that nobody has studied how systematically this problem is throughout the world. There are very few countries in which this does not happen. Um, never taken up as a policy, as a policy issue. Um, you know, we're, 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 this, is, this, is, this is something that needs to be uh, taken up by both academic and the policy community. Um, why am I here? I'm here because of because of my daughter, because my daughter, not too long ago, sent me a, a message saying, you know, a, a, about a tech talk, suggesting that, that, that men need to get involved. So I'm just going to touch, you know, I'm just going to make a quote. Again, it comes from, from Mr. Katz, and he says, uh, we need men, more men with the guts, with the courage, with the strength, with the moral integrity, to break our complicit silence and challenge each other and stand with women and not against them. Thank you. Um, and we also would like men who realize that they have genders. <laughs> okay. um, hello, I, I'm Jelen Taklarit. I'm from the Women's Legal and Human Rights Bureau based in the Philippines. Um, I think... Um, a challenge was being uh, was is being posed. I mean, by most of our panelists and speakers, and I think even in other movements, this is what we, as feminists, as activists, um, we really, I think, we really have to redefine what do we mean by political participation. That political participation doesn't necessarily mean. I think what Valentina was saying about quota system having just women, but for us to define and to ensure what is what we make visible what what Anita was saying about making it visible it I think as women as feminists as internet activists we have to ensure that we have a role to influence those who are in power what to make visible what I, what do we mean by gender and internet rights I think that's something that we have to claim we put meanings if the meaning is lost somewhere else we have to take it back again and put meanings to it Hello, my name is Anti. I'm going to translate both of our Indonesian colleague. So, ya, yeah. terima kasih. Selamat pagi. Saya Ketut. Saya dari Bali. Uh, saya dari komunitas. Gak apa-apa. Saya dari komunitas uh, Ikatan Perempuan Positif Indonesia. Uh, saya mewakili teman-teman di sini yang ODA. So good morning. My name is Ketut. I'm from. I'm belongs to uh, Alliance Women's Alliance of uh, which HIV and AIDS of Indonesia, and I represent my uh, organization here. Yeah. 
uh, kami ingin internet ini menjadi memberikan informasi yang lengkap buat kami tentang layanan kesehatan dan tentang obat-obatan yang harus kami konsumsi karena obat itu tidak harus dikonsumsi sehari, se dua hari atau sebulan. Ini kami konsumsi seumur hidup. So actually we want uh, we want to raise our main concern that uh, we need this internet as a space of information and also as a uh, an access to uh, a health versus uh, uh, pelayanan kesehatan means health services for uh, taking care because we have to drink an, an RFV this is not only we drink one or two days it's we, we, we have to drink it all for all, almost of our lives so we need this uh, space as a source of information also karena selama ini meskipun saya sebagai salah satu aktivis di Bali uh, saya hanya mendapatkan informasi dari mulut ke mulut bahwa sudah ada pengobatan ORP yang lebih bagus yang harus diminum hanya satu kali satu hari tetapi itu baru isu tidak ada kejelasan sampai sampai sekarang so actually uh, since I'm the activist uh, from Bali and who raised this HIV and AIDS issue uh, I only heard the information from mouth to mouth and it is uh, not very clear because it's not a uh, uh, has a one source that could be accessed by our uh, groups something like that uh, terus terang meskipun saya aktivis saya tahu obat itu untuk beberapa tahun ke depan ada tetapi untuk selamanya apakah itu ada apakah uh, stok itu selalu ada kami selalu dalam ketakutan kalau suatu saat stok obat itu habis karena kami tidak mampu beli So actually as an activist I really worried and uh, concerned about this uh, information because we know that the uh, the stock of uh, the RFV medicine is only for two or three years uh, again but what about uh, for the measures or uh, even more uh, than uh, that times uh, I feel very worried and scared about this maybe it's not only me and other uh, colleagues in Indonesia also feel about this Uh, karena kami sekarang ini punya dampingan, punya teman-teman yang tidak hanya orang dewasa yang sudah terinfeksi, kami punya dampingan yang anak-anak kecil juga yang masa depannya masih sangat panjang, kalau orang dewasa mungkin dalam umur 60-70 tahun sudah meninggal, tapi bagaimana dengan anak-anak kami, karena banyak keluarga, satu keluarga yang positif. So actually, uh, I, I would also raise the uh, other issue that now we are concerned about our next generation who got HIV and AIDS because our, our children and, and next generation also have this kind of issue and we would like to know whether the information uh, in the internet also prov can provide this RFV medicine to our next generation. Ya, terima kasih. Mudah-mudahan di sini menjadi uh, pintu buat kami untuk mendapatkan informasi yang lebih jelas. Terima kasih. So I think that it is very important for us to raise up, and I think that this forum is very important to know what which kind of information can be uh, access to us. Um, I will close this session for now. I know there's more comments that wants to be made, but we will have it again after the next um, group, just so that we are managing the sort of time. But thank you for the very important interventions about political will and commitment from a range of people and the critical um, right to health, um, right to information that actually impacts on so many levels of, uh, especially those who are most marginalized and disadvantaged. Um, I've got news. Oh. Okay. I've been tweeting from this platform and you can read with me here. I got a tweet from Parent Club. Your tweet just earned you an invite to our Allied Family Safety Network and I've got a claim code. So I have a lot of people following us online That's great. and I'm really grateful that these Indonesian women are here. We love you. We are one world. Thanks. Thank you, Nana. Um, so, before we close the public the section on public participation, we got is actually providing an input into this section, and then we will move immediately after that into safety and freedoms because really they are kind of a little bit artificial categories anyway. One relates very much to the other. So, Nikat. Um, yeah, I'm Nikat. I'm from Pakistan, and 
uh, I work for an organization called Digital Rights Foundation and sorry for my voice, uh, it's due to so thought it's not sexy as always. <laughs> So um, I'll uh, um, bring, bring up a couple of uh, instances from Pakistan which actually shows that how uh, in these incidents actually hindrances the public participation of women online. We have 20 million internet users in Pakistan and we still don't have any study or research where we can find out that how many women internet users are in Pakistan. Uh, according to an in industry study, women, uh, women make 14% in Pakistan labor force in the IT sector. And I would like to mention some of the reasons that why we don't see uh, much women public participation uh, in the online space in Pakistan. Some of them are inadequate access to the, te to the technology. High cost of access to the equipment, uh, restrictive cultural stereotypes that discourage women from engaging with the technology. And we have very few female tech savvy role models and mentors. And um, here I want to uh, mention one uh, recent unfortunate incident where uh, two teenager girls have been shot dead in an apparent honor killing in the north of Pakistan after a video was circulated showing them dancing in the rain. So, I mean, you can, you can see that how using technology or access to ICT is you know, is is so complex for women in Pakistan that you know they just recorded their video and somehow the video was circulated in the neighborhood in, and then in the village and then the um, family actually decided to you know honor kill to to kill them just because of their honor. Um, another incident I want to mention that how laws and regulations are. Use, uh, are being used in Pakistan against the feminists who use these online space to share their opinion and views. One of the feminists just a um, couple of months back, um, no, I think a year ago, she mentioned a harassment incident on Twitter about one person who is, uh, who is a lawyer in Pakistan. And that person actually used a defamation law against that feminist to file a defamatory suit against her that how she, she, she's actually de defaming me in the online space. So, I mean, we, we actually, in the developing countries, I think we need to see that how not only the cultural stereotypes, but how these laws and regulations are using against, are being used against the women who are taking place, who are reclaiming this space. And as Valentina said, that we have to reclaim this space. This is the space where we can share our views and opinions. We don't, like developing countries in Pakistan, we don't have much spaces where we can share the discourse, right? Where we can start the discourse. So this online space gives us that freedom where we can share our opinions, views, we can start, you know, discussion around LGBT rights. And LGBT is something, you know, very risky in countries like Pakistan to talk about that. But how the other, how the opponents or the people who, you know, against them, the opinions are being shared, use these regulations and laws against feminists and women human rights defenders. So I think collectively we need to think about that how we can, um, how, how we can, uh, you know, uh, make this, this space useful and, you know, is how to make the movement strong to, you know, um, to, to give support to the feminists and women human rights defenders in the developing countries who are using this space for their advocacy, for sharing their opinions and views. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to next call upon Sheila. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Sheila Rashid, and uh, I am uh, I work on internet policy in India. Uh, currently, I'm looking at internet reliability, but in the past, I have worked with uh, the Internet Democracy Project, which uh, conducted a study on uh, online abuse faced by women 
uh, on public platforms such as blogs, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, and I'll uh, share with only the key findings uh, from the from the study, and then we want to what we want to focus on, which is developing new legal strategies to deal with these. Uh, so, just quickly, what kind of uh, so which women get uh, abuse? online, which where the women who receive abuse online. So we know that this issue of online abuse, it gained importance uh, when online abuse faced by popular women, so to speak, uh, came to the fore. But uh, we did this study precisely to scratch beneath the surface and find out whether it's only popular women who receive abuse online or is it not so popular women as well. And uh, indeed, the study points out that uh, popular women need to see more abuse, yes. But uh, women who are not so popular on the internet, uh, the abuse that they face is uh, it's, uh, not very well recognized and also they don't receive a lot of support. So when a woman who doesn't have many followers on Twitter is facing abuse, she doesn't have many people to sort of support her. Uh, number two, uh, what are the various layers of abuse? So I'll explain it in this way. Uh, number one, you receive abuse online just because you're a woman. Uh, number two, you receive more abuse if you represent a marginalized identity, which could be uh, lower caste uh, classes, the so-called lower castes, um, then heteronormative uh, sexual orientations, religious minorities, physically uh, challenged or marginalized in other ways. Uh, so that seem to you know, uh, generate an additional <laughs> layer of abuse. Uh, third, on top of that, if you're talking about overtly feminist topics, and if you're talking about women's rights, that seems to uh, generate some additional abuse. And if you're talking about certain specific topics which may be inconvenient to you know, certain politicians or certain ideologies, it seems to add to the abuse. Uh, but so when the study uh, sort of uh, found out that there is a striking similarity between the internet and the street, so having said all this, you don't really have to do anything online to be uh, to receive abuse. You just have to be a woman. Uh, so just like on the street, you don't really have to do anything to be harassed or stalked or stared at. You just have to be a woman. Uh, so that was one uh, striking similarity between the internet and the street uh, that the study uh, pointed towards. And um, uh, so what are the strategies that uh, women use to deal with this kind of abuse? Uh, so these were uh, varied across different profiles and uh, one woman could also use a mix of all these strategies. Uh, so the law, like resorting to the law, at least in the particular case of India, I'm not sure if I mentioned that uh, all the participants, were, you know, all the interviews in the research were based in India. So the, in the particular... Okay. Sorry, one more minute. Okay. Uh, so law, like resorting to the law did not uh, figure as a key strategy. Women did not go to the police, like not very often, at least the women we interviewed did not. Um, so the women seem to use a mix of non legal strategies, which could be number one, ignoring the abuse, number two, moderating comments on forums that allow for this. So basically, if someone leaves uh, an abusive comment on your blog, you can choose to uh, either moderate it or uh, you can edit, edit the abuse parts or uh, leave it out altogether. Third, blocking abusers. Number four, reporting the abusers. Uh, uh, and I'm not talking about the effectiveness of these strategies. I'm not talking about the strategies that women use. Number five, looking for and finding support. So, for example, if I receive uh, an abuse tweet, I retweet it with perhaps the expectation that other people will back me up or you know, call the abuse out. Number six is money and shaming, which is uh, also similar to retweeting. Uh, number seven, taking the trolls head on, that is trying to reason with them and argue with them. And number eight uh, is self-censorship. And actually, Bishakha pointed out in one of the sessions that self-censorship is also harm. It's not just a strategy, it's also harm that uh, is caused by online abuse. Uh, 
uh, so i would like uh, the floor to also discuss or you know share their strategies uh, on dealing with the uh, you know, such experiences because we have been trying uh, like most of our focus has been on developing non legal strategies and that's what i would like everyone to focus on thank you thank you shaila um and next i'll just pass it very quickly to gayatri from sita Thanks, Jack. Good morning. Um, so I'll first start by saying that Anita, I don't know if you remember, but uh, we met in Hyderabad, yes. and uh, so I would say that she's kind of my guru lah to some of the issues about internet governance. So I hope I've learned some things. Uh, but today I'm here uh, representing the Southeast Asian Press Alliance. It's a regional network of media freedom advocacy groups in Southeast Asia. I know a lot of people, a lot of groups have media as their communication strategy, but I believe that it's one of the last items on the list. Um, and I think that this is probably one of the challenges where uh, the issue of mainstreaming gender uh, and also mainstreaming internet governance um, is a problem. So um, I said to Jack that I think I have more questions than actually trying to answer, but um, I will share two key issues that i think uh we see and that we may be interested in other groups also raising the questions uh, and also doing research number 1 is um i think the the use of the technology or the advent of the technology has definitely allowed for more women to be able to uh become content producers um in environments that are safe for them um so i'm talking about journalists i'm talking about bloggers uh citizen journalists so it does give an opportunity uh to work within environments that are safer for them but at the same time it also presents its own kinds of uh threats uh where there's this dependence on the technology the exposure that uh individuals face um so there is that advantage but at the same time it has its own uh challenges um one of the questions that i think is uh or at least it would be interesting to ask is with time has it become safer for journalists women journalists or journalists from um quite vulnerable positions so i'm talking about uh groups like indigenous uh communities um has the internet uh actually made it safer for them to work um so for example in the past you know you had to have face to face interviews or phone interviews but now if you could use emails uh social networking tools does that remove the element of harassment intimidation that does exist in the more uh physical space so you know we do hear about women who have to cover political issues and when they have to interview some of the politicians you know you get a lot of sexist remarks sometimes they say oh you want to interview me come up to my room i'll be there come at 10 o'clock at night you know so now if you replace that with the technology uh do you then remove some of this uh threats we're not sure uh, i think it would be very interesting to find out if um there is a benefit or whether it actually um introduces new kinds of harassment and and um uh, intimidation so i think just listening about uh how the study that you have uh, shared um that you have other kinds of you know harassment so i think in the context of the media it would be quite interesting to see how journalists are able to do their work citizen journalists bloggers um so i wish that we were doing the research but we are not However, I'm very happy to share that there is an ongoing survey now by uh the Institute for News Safety uh together with the International um Women's Media Foundation and UNESCO. It's an on it's it's a regular survey that they do in terms of uh safety of women journalists. Uh one of the questions that they have in the survey is uh whether they do face intimidation um or harassment online um or in terms of digital rights. So at least that question has been put in into the survey uh the results are expected to be released on the uh international day to end uh, violence against women on the 25th so I hope that it's it will be there in time I'll be very interested to see what it is but I think that um um maybe we can speculate just looking at the cases in Southeast Asia where we see a lot of bloggers many of whom are women also are uh, facing challenges so I think it will be very uh, crucial for that Just another point I wanted to sort of uh flag we do have this publication it's a bit of a pitching um we do have a fellowship program every year and this year we deliberately chose the topic of internet governance and freedom of expression in Southeast Asia so it's uh we were very happy that when we 
needed to pick the judges for the selection. They were all women. Uh, four out of the six successful candidates, two of whom are here, are women. Um, and a number of women were interviewed in the countries, Burma and Singapore. And I think it, it's, it's a very important narrative for us to say that uh, they are experts and uh, also knowledgeable people on the issue of uh, internet. So it's not a best practice per se, but I think that we're very proud that we are sort of adding on to the sort of, you know, discussions. Thank you, and thank you for um, sort of talking about sort of different opportunities that we are creating. Um, I'm going to shake up the format a little bit, and I'm going to just continue to the next section of this of the thematic area, and then manage the time quite strictly. So I will really, literally, be walking in front of you and going, um, taking the mic away, and then we will have like 15 minutes at the end, just to like have a bigger discussion. And I would also love to hear from people from other stakeholders. So if there's people from the private sector, or from the government, or from the technical and academic community, it'd be great to hear from you as well. So um, the next final issue that we would like to look at is given that all of these issues are emerging from trying to, you know, the, and the criticality of actually decision making and opportunities and co political commitment, how, what are the uh, internet governance principles um, and processes that need to guide this process, given that we're here at the IGF? Um, and I would like to call upon Anya to kickstart this conversation. Thank you, Jack. I'm uh, Anya from the Internet Democracy Project in India. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and also in front of a room that's actually quite full, which is very heartening. I think when we're being pessimistic of where generations are going in Internet governance, perhaps sometimes we're overdoing it. Um, the issue that I wanted to talk uh, about in particular takes off basically from uh, the comment Anita made earlier about representation. Um, Modern stakeholderism as a model for internet governance that kind of brings all stakeholder groups in internet governance together has been criticized a lot. Um, because the representation of marginalized groups in a model that where basically people select themselves has always been uh, fairly low. I think we have to be really careful though, uh, not to simply push for more diversity instead. What you see at the moment is that governments, uh, especially from the Western world, often harp on diversity, but do that at the expense of actually strengthening participation as such. And so they claim that they are developing multi-stakeholderism, but as long as multi-stakeholderism doesn't kind of live up to its promise, which is that of shared decision making, more diversity does not necessarily mean more impact. And so th I think it's really important that we not forget that and not make one go at the expense of the other, but that we keep the two together. We need substantive participation, impact on real decisions at the same time as we keep open um, uh, the realization that we need to bring in more people and think about how to do that. I'd also briefly want to move then to the question of, so how do you structure that? Because I think that's one of the core questions in this. We all need to think of a system to actually organize participation uh, if you don't just want diversity to be there for the sake of diversity. In the big debate about internet governance, so far you had the, the UN is going to take over the internet camp and uh, everything is fine as it is camp. I think for marginalized people, for people without voice or power, neither will do. What we need to move towards instead, rather than having one new internet body that will solve all the problems that exist related to the internet, which is a place and not an issue, all over the world, what we need instead is a decentralized model, where we try and draw as much as possible on existing processes, but kind of streamline more how the participation in these processes can work. And when one looks at what are processes we could draw on, you have, for example, uh, the WISIS action lines, which come out of the World Summits on the Information Society in 2003 and 2005, which also gave birth to the IGF. In the, world, the action lines, there is actually already a lot of internet governance. So we would say that uh, instead of starting a new body, we need to built on this existing uh, um, model and kind of try and spread out participation as much as possible so that people don't know exactly where an issue is going to be dealt with and what the outcome is. And we believe that in governments in general, you've always seen that for people with less voice, more decentralized governments 
with very clear outcomes has a much greater uh, chance of actually having an impact. So we propose that even to promote gender issues in internet governance, this is the model that we should follow here as well. Thanks, Thanks. Anya. And given that, I would like to pass the floor then to Sian Hong, who's from UNESCO, and to tell us a little bit about UNESCO's initiatives in this area. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to hear all the interesting uh, cases and the opinions here. Uh, yeah, as as uh, as our speaker said, that the United Nations has always been taking a very strong uh, initiative to promote uh, women and girls' rights and gender equality. It's on. United Nations Millennium Development Goals, and now we are reaching to the end of this Millennium Plan. Uh, according to the recent uh, consultation process to envision the post-2015 agenda, the gender-based uh, discrimination and uh, inequality is still very widespread, uh, which means it will continue to be prioritized for the post-2015 development agenda. And uh, specific to UNESCO, gender equality has always been our global priority. Actually, we only have two global priority. One is Africa, the other one is gender, which means that we are going, we are mainstreaming it in all our program, whether education, culture, whether communication, human rights, we have a strong gender po opponent. Our direct general is a woman. It's the first uh, woman direct general in UNESCO in the history of 60 years. And uh, we are striking a balance in the UNESCO staffing. And also, most importantly, we are mainstreaming gender in our programs. Even when we organize any meetings, like to have 50% percentage of women participants and speakers in every uh, event. And uh, specific, and even last year, I think the UNDP, they have adopted the gender indicator in the uh, Human Development Index which means that uh, whether or the women's uh, position and development uh, should be a very important uh, indicator to measure the level of uh, development in any country. I, I have seen that such advancement in terms of awareness, but still it is so lagged behind uh, uh, compared to our expectations since we still have so many sad cases happening every day in every part of the world. And uh, I'm very happy just now to have heard that uh, the safety project, uh, uh, which has reached the Indonesian the Asian stakeholders, exactly the project I've been working on since last year. That our uh, our researcher has been done a global survey and interviews with all continents uh, on the on the uh, online safety uh, for those bloggers and journalists. We have a strong gender perspective. To we have one semantic area to focus on the gender issues in this research. And so specific to UNESCO's work, I also want to announce a very important global initiative we are going to do in December. Uh, from 2 to 4 uh, December in this year, we are going to hold uh, the uh, global forum on media and agenda in Bangkok. Uh, again, in Asia, we have, uh, we, we like, uh, all of you to, to go there to bring a more uh, strong element on the internet and the, and, the I, and the ICTs because you know, you know this uh, forum is called the Media and Agenda. And agenda. Uh, media's notion has been uh, renovated, but still uh, many uh, stakeholders remain to be the traditional media uh, regulators, lawmakers, but still, I mean, they also need to, uh, to, to update their ideas, how to make laws in this new, okay, I'm finishing now. So uh, now the concept paper program are under, under working, and the, uh, the output is going to uh, make a global alliance on media and, uh, and gender. You can all check and Google global forum on media and uh, uh, gender. UNESCO and is there everything there. Uh, we ask for your partnership. You can propose a session. You can go to and speak, uh, and we we'll eventually will go go uh, go into the joint uh, action. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, it's quite an interesting uh, initiative in that you really can um, participate at many different levels in terms of setting the agenda as well as organizing events. So the final speaker I'd like to call upon is Marian Franklin. Uh, from the Internet Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition to tell us about what principles can guide us in this process. Right, thank you very much. Uh, my first comment is, um, I 
Uh, yes. When you listen to some of the cases here, you realise that not all law is good law. So that's my first caveat. We have developed a charter of human rights and principles for the internet, and that is drawn from other important precursor and parallel initiatives such as the APC Internet Rights Charter. And this one, of course, doing that has embedded itself in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and all other UN international law standards, which include, of course, women's rights. So human rights are women's rights, as we know, and internet rights are also women's rights. But when we talk about rights, it's very difficult sometimes to get down to basics. And as Nina reminds us, we have to go down to ground level. So all these cases remind me uh, very much when I look over the current charter, which we're looking to uh, not only promote and launch in its current version, now that we have it in good old-fashioned hard copy, but to think about where to go next with it. And in our second, in clause two, of course, it talks about the right to non-discrimination in internet access, use, and governance. And it is here that there is an explicit mention of gender equality. Not explicit enough to my mind, because as always with these documents, you need to find a phrasing that is inclusive, <laughs> but also not too vague. So my point is, uh, this is an invitation for people in this room to help us with the next stage of the charter, to provide feedback for where these parts of this larger document, 21 clauses, where you could imply, you can say that women and gender issues are implicit, they are mentioned, they relate to every clause. However, I feel some of these things need to be made a little bit more specific. Um, and that's where we need your help. This charter is a framework from which we can actually build discussion and talk to lawmakers and talk to regulators and say to regulators, this is how the online environment affects everyday life and how everyday life itself can help us create concrete examples of how better law can be made because, again, not all law is good law and we're looking for good law, fair law, proportionate law, the rule of law is not an absolute instrument and this is the work we have ahead of us because my final point is with the Charter you are now in a clear concrete form, um, I'm amazed at how effective putting things on paper actually is, <laughs> uh, <laughs> even though it's dead trees, um, we've tried to be environmentally sensitive, but uh, this allows us to translate this particular document and have it feed into these lawmaking processes. But the thing about participation that Anita and Anya have brought up, our own reflection on our own representation in politics, who are we speaking for? I'm speaking here for the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition and the wider community that represents, but I'm also thinking of my younger women students with whom I work from Indonesia, from Malaysia, from Kazakhstan, from Turkey, from parts of the United Kingdom where there's severe social economic deprivation, from all over the world, and to get them to understand that everyday issues are not a simple matter of assuming the lawmakers will do good. We elect our governments, but we need to call our governments to account. So the very important stakeholder who needs to be brought into this scenario, we hope through the Charter, because it's a legal, legal document, we hope, are our governments. So there we go, that's the job ahead of us. Don't even make much sense, but thanks very much. Thanks, Marianne. Um, and I won't waste time summing up. Um, I think sh there was an intervention that's been waiting for a while. Um, quick, quick intervention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Samitri from uh, University of Erlangui, uh Public University in Indonesia. I want to know uh, because of uh, uh, I hope that we have a more issue dealing with the disabled and women and internet uh, accessibility because they have no access in information and education and also employment. Oh, it is long life burden for, for them, especially for girls, for the parents, for the mother who take care by herself. Yeah only herself uh, who cares the 
children who uh, are disabled like that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for raising that question. Um, Another one here. Yeah, terima kasih. Uh, nama, eh, nama saya Farida. Saya dari uh, salah satu komunitas LGBT di Indonesia di Makassar. Jadi uh, Facebook, Twitter dan email terutama di Facebook itu menjadi media sosial tempat kami untuk berdiskusi. Uh, tempat kami sharing uh, untuk seluruh Indonesia. So, uh, my name is Farida. I'm from uh, Makassar, South Sulawesi. I represent the LGBT uh, groups in Indonesia. So, actually, the, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other me social media is becoming our safe space to uh, discuss and to learn together. Uh, through not only in a uh, certain area but through all of the Indonesia. Kami sering mendapatkan pelecehan dan kekerasan terutama tentang orientasi seksual kami. Ketika itu diketahui oleh teman-teman keluarga bahkan pemerintah dan salah satunya ada komunitas dari Alfonis teman kami yang dibagikan tadi disampaikan oleh ibu ketua Komnas Ham. So actually, she says that we openly got harmful and violence because of our different sexual orientation to the internet itself because we uh, we try to campaign our rights, our status to the campaign and then we got this violence violence from our families, from our colleagues or friends, even if from the government for example, one of the cases like our uh, uh, a new colleague uh, website is uh, always website being blocked until right now, and there is no reason why then uh, the website starts being blocked. Kami sering mendapat kekerasan secara verbal yang mengatasnamakan agama, uh, yang mencaci maki kami tentang orientasi seksual kami, dan yang uh, lebih menyakitkan sejak kami secara psikologi itu adalah ketika mereka bertanya tentang sampai kepada perilaku seksual. So actually, we openly also got uh, violence and harmful from uh, the uh, the people who was uh, uh, as morality and religious uh, statement uh, because they openly judge us uh, of our different uh, sexual orientation and also evenly they are trying to what is this to access more of uh, or to. They're trying to, what is this? Yes. <laughs> so, so I think that the, the, what is this, uh, the society that using the morality and the religious openly harmful and violence them, uh, even if they are so much, so deep about their uh, attitudes uh, in uh, sexual. Ya, kami masih ada beberapa kasus uh, data kasus. Jadi kalau misalnya teman-teman, uh, terutama ibu komnas ketua komnas yang membutuhkan data tentang kekerasan yang kami dapatkan, kami bisa membantu. Terima kasih. Secondly, she said that it's very important for us, and also we openly want to discuss about these things, especially for other uh, colleagues here in Indonesia, and also about uh, Miss uh, Mrs. Laila from Komnas Perempuan, uh, Komnas Ham. So she really want to talk about this further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think there was a brief intervention from. Can we open it to the floor first, and then back to you? Is that okay? Sorry. Camilla, you want to speak? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to say something. Okay. I just want to say something like uh, it's so visible. Um, the issue that we're facing here during the IGF 2013 is um, the visibility of Miss Internet Bali going around this venue of the conference, like trying to be like ambassador of, about as a woman and internet. And uh, we, as the feminist network at, at IGF right now, is trying to prepare a statement and in how we protest that um, the initiative from Indonesia ISP Association is 
like putting back women into the domestic area where right now our struggle is trying to support women's leadership and women's representative at internet governance and internet rights activism. That's it. Thank you. I think there was a comment from the back. Can I see a few more? Is there any more? Okay, one here. Which I'm going to hold you because you've already commented. Is there anyone from a different state, from a private sector stakeholder or government that would like to intervene as well? No? One, two. Okay. A gentleman at the back and then... Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel from Uganda, representing the Uganda Network, a network for LGBT organizations and sex, sex work organizations. Uh, the problem in Uganda is not about the government alone, it's also about other individuals in society. For instance, we are using Facebook and Twitter and maybe Skype to meet with other people, interact with other people, and also for commercial sex workers, they get their clients from Facebook. But also other individuals in society are also using Facebook to come against these communities, against the LGBT community. For instance, uh, a few months ago there was a Facebook page opened up uh, under the name Kampala Exposed. After every 10 minutes they were exposing a, a gay person or a lesbian person, where they work from, where they live, and what they do, what they are friends, where they hang out. So these were just individuals under in government. And now the government is also proposing a, a law, a bill, uh, anti-pornographic bill, which is going to make it even hard to, you know, people access internet. Because they are proposing that if uh, an internet service provider allows pornography to be downloaded through their service, they are going to pay a fine of 10 Ugandan million shillings and also go to prison for five years. <laughs> and I mean, this will just lead to blocking all websites because they wouldn't want to, you know, to incur all these economic costs. Understand? And also the issue of hacking, because for instance, our, our website was hacked uh, sometimes in February this year, and we worked on that issue with Freedom House America. So these are some of the issues these communities are facing in Uganda. And also the issue of access among the sex workers' communities is also a very big issue. Yet we are trying to teach these people on how to use uh, tools like Washaidi just in case they got into problems. But again, access is a problem because the cost is very high for a sex worker. Understand? So those are some of the issues. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Xiaofui. I'm from Malaysia. I'm a journalist. Uh, I have a question uh, directed to, um, not so much a comment, uh, to Anya because she mentioned something about the uh, kind of model for multi-stakeholderism. Uh, I just want to know if there, uh, if there is any example or in, uh, can you give more detail how is, it was done? Thank you. Anya, would you like to quickly respond? <laughs> Quickly, <yeah>. Quickly. <laughs> 30 seconds. How would Business Action Line work? <coughs> the Business Action Lines already have uh, designated areas to work on various issues. There is a de designated area for each uh, action line, but only an action line you actually have a whole bunch of issues. So, for example, privacy comes under uh, C5, action line C5, which has cyber security. That happens to be the ITU, which some people wouldn't be too uh, enthusiastic about. But privacy also comes up in various other action lines where it is UNESCO. So our proposal would be that these agencies work together to start a multi-stakeholder dialogue around the issue of how privacy is best dealt with globally, to fix a very well-defined agenda and then to decide how to move forward. The actual solution in terms of moving forward needn't necessarily be multi-stakeholder in the sense that that group can decide that, for example, a treaty is the best way to deal with this. And if a treaty is indeed the best way to deal with this, treaties are being negotiated by governments and that should probably stay like that. But the group will be responsible for kind of setting out the modalities the, the kind of basis within which the governments then would need to work. And so in that sense, the chances that the treaty will actually have an outcome that everybody agrees to uh, is are much bigger. So that's one example, but you can do this for each issue. And for issues that don't have a home yet in the business action line, the current working group on enhanced cooperation that's kind of looking into how governments can improve internet governance can map the remaining issues and look at various other kinds of processes that already exist and kind of push to take these things forward through them. The Brazil Icon Summit that I think in this IGF 
a lot of people have been talking about is another example of a venue that could be used to do this. Thank you. Thanks, Anya. Um, is there any, any final comments before seeing home with response? Uh, yeah, uh, very quick uh, to on the WSIS action line review or uh, further to Anis' uh, comments. We are reviewing all the uh, WSIS action lines. UNESCO particular, we are review C9 media, C10, uh, Essex, uh, C, uh, C8 uh, culture. Uh, now, I must admit in the past 10 years that the gender is not so prominent in the WSIS action line implementation stage. But, but now it's time that we're reviewing that we're really putting a very strong gender element to all the action lines with a more combined consolidated strategy as he said, she said that uh, many elements should be really come understood in a holistic way. We're also promoting the internet universality into the post-2015 with this agenda. In this uh, concept, we, we, we have the gender to, to, to uh, penetrate into every pillar principle. Uh, not only multi-stakeholder, women are important multi-stakeholder to be participating in the governance procedure, but also in terms of the accessibility, the capacity building uh, components, uh, women's uh, literacy and skills. And also in terms of the in terms of the human rights, as we all, all talked about, and also in terms of technology openness, we should have the gender-based uh, more uh, friendly to women's use, women's uh, women's inter interfaces. So that's all there. I, I wish we can really make advancement in the post Okay, thank you. Um, I will have to close it because you're going to end soon. But before I close, I just wanted to quickly bring up some of the, the, some of the things that were discussed. First of all, thank you very much to all of the discussions and everybody on the floor for your participation. I just want to have a clap. Um, this has been a very, very rich uh, and multifaceted discussion and really um, quite uh, clearly, you know, gender and internet governance is not something that we can cover in one and a half hours. There's many different aspects to this. And the first main key issue that was raised is the whole issue around intersectionality, that you can't really look at gender without looking at how this cuts across all of the different areas of disabilities, of sexualities, of economic uh, empowerment and so on and so forth. And that we need to cast the gender lens on any kinds of initiatives around improving women's access. And we need to bear in mind that intersectionality is also a big issue around this. That is, and there's many different ways to look at it, from infrastructure to policy to education. And there's ways that everybody can play. From, and this is where the political commitment and will comes in, right, from everyone. So from the private sector, from civil society, from national human rights um, institutions, and so on. Um, and the, and even as, um, and clearly, um, sorry, I'm jumping a bit everywhere, but clearly access to the internet has a huge role to play in impacting um, women's rights um, and um, full enjoyment of our rights, actually, as, as full participatory citizens. Um, and this, is, uh, this has been um, especially discussed in terms of people who are marginalized in different ways, in terms of their sexuality and also in terms of uh, maybe religious minority and so on. But even as we are going to these spaces and occupying it and, um, and, and, um, and, um, um, and reaching it with our discourses and perspectives, there are strategies of silencing that's happening from violence to the use of law um, to defamation and so on. Sorry, it's everywhere. Sorry? Naming and shaming. Um, and what is necessary is not just good laws and good laws that is grounded by human rights principles, but also mechanisms and structures that enable greater participation of women into all of these different things. And we've discussed some of this to, um, to actually quite great depth. And I would like to encourage you, if you're, if you're interested to continue in this conversation, it doesn't stop here. We have a gender dynamic coalition meeting on day four, in the morning of day four at nine o'clock again, I think. Um, but please check the timetable. It could be, you could be lucky, it could be 10.30. Um, but please join us at that meeting so that we can talk about this more. It's really a strategizing meeting, so we will discuss about this in greater detail. Um, and at 12.30 today, there will be a book launch, Gender and Information Society Watch book launch that really looks at all of the different areas around gender and information society. Um, and the thematic focus this year is on um, women's rights and gender. And some of the speakers here will also be able to extrapolate a little, a little bit more on their thinking in this area. So thank you very much. The meeting is at 11, Jack. Ah, it's at 11, yes. 
So day four, 11. Okay, please join us. I know it's day four. I know the beach is calling, but you know, it's only one and a half hours and there'll be huge. You'll feel really good after that. You'll be like, yes, I've done something. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.